This is episode 169 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Taylor Jones. Taylor is the head of acquisition at STR Search. And if you don't know by now, STR stands for Short Term Rental and the head of acquisition at TechFester. He is knee deep in short term rentals. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate the intro. Yeah, because we were just talking before and you are in this asset class very deep, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, eat, breathe, and sleep it at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's important. We can start with n niches because, you know, asset classes are so wide and variegated. How did you end up in the short-term rental space? Yeah, so it was actually a lifelong sales guy um, chasing commission. So that was kind of how things started uh, after college. Eight different sales jobs, always <laughs> just... Uh, like I said, just chasing commissions. Get the better commissions, yeah. Exactly. Chase, chase the ladder. Didn't matter what I was selling. COVID hit, had a client-facing sales job. So the only way to make money was to secure new contracts from clients. And they kind of shut down the world in March of 2020. So wasn't fired, but wasn't allowed to go sign new commissions. And so it was kind of a, oh man, yeah, this is- this The well's a, dry. Yeah, this is not a great spot to be in. But fortunately, I had all the time in the world and had always had a niche for real estate, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, um, but I got to kind of explore just about everything. I looked at Burr, I looked at multifamily, I looked at Section 8, do I want to be a broker, do I want to flip, and naturally kind of stumbled onto short-term rentals. Now, I wish that I had looked sooner because me and my wife, we've actually been consumers of Airbnb since 2015, so it wasn't like it was new to look at this. I, right. I've been on one you know, side of the equation, I just never looked at the unit economics of being a host. Yeah. Obviously, I wish I'd done that in 2015. It'd be a, a heck of a heck of an opportunity. Yeah. But, um, you know, started diving in, consuming, you know, YouTube videos, bigger pockets, reading books, articles, et cetera, and just decided to start writing offers. I, I'm one of those, uh, you got to take action. There's too many analysis paralysis uh, that goes yeah. on and people just never do. So uh, fifth offer we wrote, we got accepted. Uh, to buy a cabin eight hours away, sight unseen in a completely different state as I'm here in Florida. Yeah. And there is obviously no mountains or no cabins. So um, flew up to Atlanta, drove an hour and a half to the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, put in a bunch of sweat equity, decided, okay, you know, overhaul the game room, new furniture, add in a fire pit, the hot tub, everything. Remember we came back and eventually the sales job came back. Naturally, you know, we we got to, I go go talk to each other face to face again. Yeah. I launched uh, on a Tuesday night, I remember, and I woke up the next morning and had uh, five bookings for over eight grand, and, and I was addicted. I, yeah. I was <laughs> like, okay, this is this is something else. And so that uh, that was kind of the pivot that really changed things. I, I was thinking while you were talking about just dynamic pricing in general, because I was thinking about the owners that get left behind. Is that Dynamic pricing is responsive to bookings and inventory, but owners who don't respond aren't like dynamically aware of what's going on. Like all the advice that you just gave for the last few minutes is know what's around you. It, those same people you said when they send you a thing and they're like, this is like a B plus, right? And you look, it's clearly like a D, just, just a D property because they have old furniture. They're like, well, I, that's almost the antithesis of your beginning avatar because they're older now. They were doing it when it was easy. And now they think, but I would stay there. And you're like, yeah, but nobody else would. Like, you're not the current avatar. You're, you know, 70. No, I'm old too. So nothing against someone 70, but you're usually not looking for, you know, like a bull riding station. It's just, you know, maybe pop pop, but. Yeah. It's um, the, the stat that I, I think will shock you uh, that, you know, we, we have a good relationship over at AirDNA. Half of all hosts have four or less prices, uh, prices, uh, price prices listed in the year. So if you're running dynamic pricing, you should in theory have 365 yeah, different prices. Exactly. The half of your competition out there has four total prices or less. So it's typically a weekday, a weekend, right. and a Holiday. couple of holidays. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. Half. So we're roughly sitting at like 1.8 million listings. So almost half your competition just has four or less prices on a given year. Freaking yeah. nuts when I saw it. It's also where the opportunity to win is. This is not a huge private equity, Starwood, KKR, Blackstone, Blackrock. They're not all in this asset class. Yeah, now, yeah, for sure. Sure, they're all chopping at the bit too. But 
you're competing against, you know, Uncle Bob who took his listing photos with his iPhone 8. Like that's right. your competition in a lot of markets. And so understanding what your top performers are, what do they have? How can you differentiate? It's just such an easy way to turn around and do it. We, we took that same strategy. So, you know, I told you the personal example with movie theaters. We go to Scottsdale, Arizona, and, you know, it's a heavy competitive market. You yeah. can't miss there. You can still win in that market. You just can't miss your, your margin of error is thinner. And we see all the top performers have pickleball courts. That's now becoming table stakes to be a top performer, not necessarily just to compete, but just to be a top yeah. performer. Well, we're like, hmm, we wonder if we could take the same strategy and go bring it over to Florida. Nobody else is putting pickleball courts in, in Florida, but Arizona, Florida, you know, you have to have a pool. So everybody's buying yeah, a house with a pool. That's, instead that's of brown, it's green. I mean, yeah, it's, it's exactly. Different. What's your take though, for, for new investors getting into the short-term space, I feel like a lot of people still think in some crazy world that this is passive real estate investing, uh, when of course it's not. How do you get people adjusted to the management aspect of short-term rentals? Uh, because some people think maybe it's going to be easy, but one bad review in the beginning can basically ruin your entire listing. Yeah. I mean, despite what your favorite guru has told you on TikTok or Instagram, this is far from passive. Uh, I would even say there's a reason the IRS classifies this as active income with material participation. <laughs> Yeah. So if the government is classifying it that way, that should kind of be the first red flag because they also, elite, um, you know, designate what is considered passive investing um, in, in the IRS code and, and short-term rentals does not fall under that breath. So, you know, you can put in systems like any business and, you know, I would highly recommend having SOPs and systems just listing on Airbnb and going through the motions is not a great way to run a business. And those are the people that, that will struggle. Can you automate parts of this? Absolutely. Can you do, but it is hospitality. And um, kind of the saying I always say is you're buying a hospitality business that just yeah. so happens to have a piece of real estate attached to it. It is not buying real estate and the other way around. So you are buying a hospitality business that, oh, by the way, over here is dangling a piece of real estate that's just attached to it for, for fun. So you can't look at this as a real estate first approach because it's not. You do get the benefits of real estate, but it is a hospitality business and operations business at its core. All the money is made on the operations side anyway. Uh, I mean, we've seen, you know, similar properties, similar market, uh, same street, um, and, and you could see 50% swings in revenue. Yeah. Um, so this is an operations business and, you know, nobody can tell you otherwise. Have you seen any new trends out there in short-term rentals, like beyond pickleball and amenities that people are doing that you think are really smart to do? as hosts or either on the property or the way that they're communicating or vetting guests? Yeah. I mean, the unique stays isn't anything new. Um, that that's just always something to, you know, continue to monitor. Um, so it's really interesting to continue to see, um, those things like that, um, you know, continue to emerge. And I keep getting blown away with all these crazy new unique structures and oh yeah it was the geodomes it was the glass it was the this and so it's just always fascinating i've always kind of sat aside and watched and try not to get shiny object syndrome and, and drift <laughs> over there myself 